some new message on call out. Hey there. Hey man. You hear me? Yep. Yeah, I got you loud and clear. Fuck, you started right on time, man. Did you get my messages on Facebook or anything? No, yeah, I was running around. I'm chasing down some insurance stuff today, so I'm on calls and trying to deal with those guys. And they don't want to pay money, so they're hard guys to deal with sometimes. Uh, all right. <laughs> all right, so why? Uh, I guess you, you understand the burden of proof is on you, right, in general? Sure, although, you know, I'm going to be making a kind of generalized argument, and I'm not going to, you know, tell you that uh, – I know exactly what's going to happen as a result of climate change because nobody knows exactly what's going to happen as a result of climate change. Uh, I'm here to just say that climate change is important because the Earth's climate is essential to human welfare for the most part. Uh, once upon a time, during the Ice Age, uh, there was about a mile of ice sitting on top of uh, the northern half of the United States of America, most of Canada, etc. That would be rather unpleasant if that were to happen today. Uh, cities fall beneath oceans from time to time. There's a number of ancient cities underneath the water. That's because the, the land rises and the seas rise and the seas fall due to changes in the Earth's climate as ice is built up into the caps or released from the caps. As the oceans warm up, they get bigger, they expand, um, they swallow up parts of the coastline. Uh, weather is very important, which is determined by climate because it uh, waters the crops and determines what you can grow in what parts of the world and where. Oh, shit, is that me? Probably. <laughs> Dance time. <laughs> it's my porn background. <laughs> Bushikawawa. Yeah, um, so, you know, these are the reasons that I think climate change in general is important to human beings, you know, as of late, um, in the last, what, I don't know, how long have we been having the climate change debate for about 20 years now, something along those lines. There's been, uh, you know, first we had the, the floral, floral, uh, chlorofloral carbons and the ozone holes up above the, um, I think ozone holes, Antarctic. I'm not a climate change expert, right? We had a bunch of deals with that. We changed the kinds of stuff that we put in, in spray cans because that was destroying part of that ozone, which, uh, you know, uh, creates problems of various kinds. You get more direct UV rays uh, down at the poles, et cetera, et cetera. So kind of dealt with that for the most part. Now the uh, issue is CO2, which is uh, determined to be something of a greenhouse gas. It traps energy. Uh, we release it by burning fossil fuels for the most part is the man-made portion of that. NASA's got some satellites up in the air now that are pretty cool. Uh, I forget what the name of the satellite is, but it can actually watch all the CO2 on the planet. Uh, and is mapping it out so we can see where the CO2 is being produced and where the CO2 is being sequestered. Um, they can even watch photosynthesis from the satellite as plants um, suck in CO2 when they're growing in the summer. They pull it up out of the air and use it to build themselves up. And then when they rot uh, in the winters, usually, or in the high summer of the desert, it releases it back out in the atmosphere so they can kind of watch the planet breathing these days as the stuff CO2 pulls up out of the atmosphere and then flows back out. Uh, they can also use that to detect volcanoes uh, when they're going to expel because as a volcano develops, it's going to release more CO2 um, as the pressure builds underneath it. And so it comes out. So they're actually think they might be able to use the system to, to detect those. That's kind of beside the point. It's cool technology. The okay. climate... And asked, like, okay, is, so are, are you defending the AGW, like anthropogenic global warming, or are you saying, like, in like in general, the climate changing matters? Or like I'm saying, in general, the climate changing matters. I don't know exactly what's going to happen as a result of climate change. I'm convinced that uh, average global temperatures have increased to some degree. Uh, there's a lot of data to support that general observation. Uh, the theory oh, goes... Yeah, I've already got a vote, and uh, I've not even said a word, really. That's pretty ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why people do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's it's <laughs> running around. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, you know, Kala did put a video where, like, as people were talking, people are voting, and the numbers are changing. and uh, <laughs> Yeah, but I don't know that that makes much yeah, sense. Not even, I've not even had made an argument yet. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, I just came to talk about it. Now, I've always talked about global climate change stuff, and I've argued it a little bit before. I'm not a meteorologist. I don't study meteorology. I don't even pretend to understand the meteorological models. I understand the idea that uh, CO2 uh, retains heat within the atmosphere. Uh, that's pretty well established. We do produce a lot of CO2 that we pump into the atmosphere. There's some 
somewhat reasonable estimates of the total metric tons that we crank out versus the amount that's out there, it is logical to say that if we change the composition of the atmosphere, it will change the behavior of the atmosphere uh, in various ways. How that affects weather, of course, I think is something that people are still trying to grapple to understand. I mean, the models are incredibly complicated and they are educated guesses, essentially. So I, I think anybody who tells you like the world is going to end is lost their mind, right? I mean, even the aggressive projections are like, you know, 20, 60, we get, you know, a foot of sea level rise or six inches or something. It's not like New York City is going to be underwater tomorrow. But in general, the climate's really important for humanity. And uh, I'm a big believer in developing sciences and developing our understanding of the world and eventually our ability to manipulate it. So I think eventually but we want to be able to do that. A weak argument. I mean, of course, you know, the climate matters in the general sense that if New York was under a mile of ice. But I mean, yeah. in the context of the after the theory of anthropogenic global warming, you know, I mean, are you are you going to make any kind of strong claims or ones that wouldn't really can't be debated? I mean. Well, it, it depends on what people want to argue. So you just said it wasn't a big deal. I think it's a big deal. I think it, well, I put it's kind of a big deal. Well, in the broadest, right? <laughs> but I, I was referring to in the way that, you know, that demands some kind of political action now. Uh, you're talking about, uh, you know, New York City being under a mile of ice. I mean, that's not something well, that's that needed to happen with, with the... It's not right? imminent, No. I'm just illustrating the general importance. So, so when it comes to policy things, there's, there's two things that I think make a lot of sense. One is uh, that we uh, research climate and climate change and continue to fund scientists who are investigating how it works and what's going on and what's happening. Do the models, do the math, do the research, uh, do the measurements, understand more about the world. I'm, I'm a big supporter of science. I'm a big supporter of that kind of research. Because I think climate is an, is an important area, just as important as medicine or uh, uh, physics or astro, you know, it's more important really than astrophysics. It's not like Saturn's going to collide with us anytime soon or any of that, right? So um, it's an important area of science that we need to study, and it does get studied. So I'm, I'm What is the that. biggest dangers? Like, well, why don't you name off the top three worst things that you think are going to be caused by climate change? And then we can kind of decide from there whether sure. or not. You know, those are, those really are a big deal because when you're yeah. talking about in the very broadest sense that, you know, a, a fucking meteor could change the climate. I mean, of right. course, in that sense, it matters, you know, if it destroys all life on Earth. But I thought we were talking about in the context of the global warming debate and whether or sure. not you know, we, we need to do something about it. You know, not, I mean, because you're making like really weak and general claims. I was wondering if we could get more specific. Well, you know, here's the thing. Like I said, again, not a meteorologist, so I can't tell you X, Y, and Z will happen. I can talk about risk analysis, right? So the, the, here's some of the risks of, uh, that if the, global, if the global warming models are accurate, right, some of the things that can happen. Uh, areas that are in low lying on the water, right? So if you're within a, a very narrow range of um, uh, sea level, um, you're at risk of, pardon? Sea level rise, that's one. Yeah, so sea level rise, you're at risk of flooding if you're near sea level. Uh, small islands, especially vulnerable to that. Uh, number two is warming of the ocean creates increased energy in storm systems uh, near the equator. Um, so thus we would have more frequent high energy storms uh, that would hit landfall in, in certain coastal areas. Um, those are the ones that I'm most familiar with and I find the most sort of directly plausible. The ones that get a little bit more complicated are like salinity changes in the ocean. And and then you tend to get in, we're not sure what'll happen, right? Coral reefs could die, you could lose species, uh, biodiversity issues. But that stuff is a lot more um, hypothetical. Uh, there's not, you know, not as much you can say. I mean, some things we understand well. Heat in the ocean creates higher energy storms. That's pretty well understood. Um, when we have especially hot years, that drives storms. And we understand that the ocean expands as it gets warmer. So global average temperatures in the ocean will do that. So those are pretty pretty clear. Earlier you said that you support science in, in general. Would you agree that the IPCC uh, fifth assessment report and the ones previous to that are an accurate representation of the scientific consensus on this issue? 
I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I don't, I don't really study that. I, I, I believe that the people who worked on that had, a, a, you know, the best interests of science at heart. They're real scientists. They're not charlatans or whack jobs or crazy people, generally speaking. Um, so I think they're giving their honest opinions based on the science that they understand. Um, whether or not it represents how broad that consensus is, I don't know. I've seen a lot of studies where people, you know, they're like, well, we've got signatures from X number of meteorologists who say it's bunk. And then other people are like, well, I can get more signatures from a meteorologist named Steve that says global warming is real. I don't know. You know, I look at those things and because I don't have an expert's view on them, I don't judge too much um, other than to take a general well, opinion of it. Well, let's posit that there's nothing more comprehensive than the IPCC consensus, if you will. Okay. Sure. Like, can we agree on that? Um, possibly. I, I mean, I haven't read the thing cover to cover, right? Okay. So uh, it, I don't know if you do know this or not, but according to the IPCC itself, uh, the confidence level on, you know, storm, storminess related to rising rises in CO le CO2 levels is not that great. Uh, like, I, I just want to point that out that often you'll hear sensationalist headlines in the media talking about like, you know, the, the latest storm is, you know, proof that climate change is real. Um, and well, th those are wrong, right? They, yeah. I mean, what's really the, the going on? does not have confidence in, in, you know, like in general, it, it's generally true that, you know, it, it can be more storminess, except that the evidence uh, does not show that there's actually more flooding or, you know, hurricanes are actually worse than they otherwise would have been. Um, so well, you, they were pretty significant really, this year, right? But it's not consistent with the actual evidence that exists, which is why they didn't give a high confidence rating for that. Well, I mean, but the thing is, we understand when we do see strong storms, we know, generally speaking, how they form. Generally, we've got warm water. You've know, you got to have winds coming in certain directions, but then you've got warm water. This this year was an especially strong El Nino event, right? So the, the waters in the Atlantic Ocean were warmer than they normally are by a couple of degrees. That increases the amount of just sheer energy of air rising, heat, hot air rising up into the atmosphere, which generates stronger winds and currents, right? Which is how storms get formed up. So the, the hotter, and, and generally the reason they, you know, they, they peter out when they hit land for two reasons. One, they lose that source of additional energy that's coming up into the storm. Two, they come over land and they get disrupted by the features and terrains of the land because out in the ocean, they're just sort of swirling around. There's not much to resist the wind, right? To slow it down. Um, so if the sea levels, if the oceans get warmer, especially in the tropical areas, it stands to reason uh, and is, is well understood that that will intensify any storm systems that are out there over the water. Now, for the storm systems to form in the first place, that's a lot more complicated and a lot harder to predict. Well, I, I would say, is it harder to predict the weather or uh, long-term trends in the climate, in your view? It depends on how far out you are. I think it, it's more difficult to predict the weather. Years. 2100. 2100? That's easier to predict than, uh, you know, when the next hurricane is going to form? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I, I, I think they're probably equally challenging for different reasons, though. Again, well, I'm, I'm not a meteorologist. Like, so. If you think about the accuracy, I mean, to, to suggest that climate models are inherently more accurate than weather models, which we know are subject to like a wide variety of variation and uncertainty. Sure. They've gotten significantly better, though. I mean, when I was a kid, yeah, I'm 46 yeah. now. When I was a kid, man, you know, weather guys had a 50-50 chance. If they just, if you just predicted that tomorrow will be the same as today, you do about as good as the average weatherman. Um, that was you know, really the most accurate prediction that was available. But these days, they really can. You can predict. They can predict the weather about a week in advance, and they're usually pretty accurate most of the time because the meteorological sciences have advanced a long ways, right? I, yeah. I suspect the but same will be with with climate predictions as well. Climate models. I mean, they've consistently been inaccurate in their predictions. Consistently. No, it's. A, I mean, it's a relatively new science, so that's to be expected. Okay, so uh, just so we're we're clear on the fact that the IPCC is not too confident in their assessments of storminess, uh, let's move on to what you consider to be the greatest threat that is posed by climate change, which is sea level rise. Um, skeptical science agrees with that claim. I wrote an article on that, um, you know, months ago. Uh, and I, I agree, like, uh, uh, you know, if that's what the scientists say and that's what the science says, then, uh, you know, so be it. Maybe th let's, let's just posit as a scientific fact that the IPCC consensus is that, 
uh, you know, uh, worst case scenario, RCP 8.5, where we burn quite literally all the oil that we know to exist that's in the ground right now. We burn yeah. all of them. Um, coal is, for the next century, is the number one fuel source of mankind. For the next century, even in an age when, you know, we're, we're growing meat in laboratory. And, you know, we're engineering algae as fuel source. For some reason, we, we decided to go back to coal. Uh, the, the, the world population booms to 12 billion. Uh, it, a lot of that growth occurs in Africa. Wealth rises in Africa substantially, but for some reason, they don't follow the same tra- trend as everywhere else, quite literally everywhere else in the world, was when you have more wealth, population starts to uh, level out. For some reason, Africa does not follow that trend in RCP 8.5. So, when we, we so we burn all the oil and the world goes completely mad. We do nothing at all to curb okay. it. And in this nightmarish, hellish scenario, the IPCC predicts that we may possibly, at the upper end, get a meter of sea level rise by 2100. At the upper end, you know that. Right. That, yeah, that, that seems like really extreme. Scenario. The worst yeah. case scenario is that we'll get one meter of sea level rise by 2100. Yeah. Now, does that seem like a scary threat to you? I and mean, that's uh, at the upper end. It could be it as low as on where I live. I, live. <laughs> I mean, if, I mean, if, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm in the, the you know, you know, Samoan, Samoan Islands, Islands. I'm getting a little, little feedback, feedback now. now. If I'm in the if Samoan I'm Islands, there. yeah, that's that's not good because my home might be underwater, right? Uh, if, I'm I'm in, if I'm in if I'm in I'm in the Florida Keys, uh, that sounds pretty crappy. We're uh, building islands in the in the Pacific Ocean. Sure, we're yeah. quite literally building islands in the. Yeah, I understand that. But, you know, not everybody who lives next to the ocean has the money to build a new island for themselves, right? Okay, I, so move. I, <laughs> sure. Yeah, they could move. Yeah, absolutely. They could. But, so what's the issue? You know, it still sucks for them. Well, we, we, well I, I could bulldoze your house tomorrow. I'm pretty sure you could move and find a new house, but you'd be pretty darn upset about the fact that I bulldozed your house, right? No, not no, if you, it, you wouldn't be on the happy. years old. If my, I'd probably end up building a new one anyways by then. Uh, okay. Um, I mean, I, I, have you ever lived in a house that's over a hundred years old? And uh, how, no, I, I guess I have not. Your house well, is over a hundred years old. Likely that most houses are going to be over a hundred years old by 21. No, no. I'm just talking if, if I come and bulldoze your house tomorrow, right? Like, right. So, but that's not what we're talking about. Me, 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 me. Right, I'm coming through. Bobby, we're talking about slow and steady increase yeah but it, it doesn't matter it's your property it's it's your livelihood you want it there if it's under threat in some fashion then you would very much like that not to be the case right so people who live in coastal areas or who are in charge of populations that live in coastal areas would very much not like to have them inundated with water right um, they would also not very much like to have to build a bunch of dikes and dams and things like that what they would like is for the ocean to stay where it's at um, that would I be the a, I want a refrigerator. Right? I want a refrigerator that cooks my breakfast for me. I mean, okay. Well, breakfast. get yourself one, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So they they right. don't want so, climate to change. Right. Well, well, that's what they're doing. You know, right? So they're saying, hey, uh, we don't want this to happen. So uh, what we would like to do is to reduce the amount of CO2 that we put out into the air by getting together and agreeing to some processes by which we can reduce those emissions. That's what they're saying. So, you know, they've got something they want and they're taking practical steps in order to try and achieve it. No, I agree that selfish people who have million dollar homes on the coast, uh, they, they're doing what they can to protect their own rational self-interest. I've never sure. disputed that. I'm just saying it's not, you know, it's not that big of a deal. I mean, I, I can name five things off the top of my head that are a lot scarier than climate change. Climate sure. change seems like a very, you know, puny issue compared for humans that are living a hundred years from now. I mean, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it puny. And it, you know, it doesn't have to be a hundred years from now. It can be significantly shorter than that. There's people that are having climate change issues right now. They already are seeing uh, sea water levels have risen and caused problems for them. Um, well, would you say it's a bigger problem than poverty? No. What about war? Uh, bigger problem than war? No, not really. Okay. Um, Obesity. Um, obesity. Um, I guess it that depends. I sort of have views on obesity that if people want to be fat, then that's their their own damn business. No, right? no, I'm just saying um, in terms of health effects, like I, we can measure the uh, like effects. the number of people who will be injured or killed. Um, uh, yeah, no, obesity probably beats war, right? In that sure. regard. Yeah, I'm not sure, but it, it very well could. 
disease. I mean, <laughs> there's a, so many actual disease issues that exist right here, right now that are right. objectively scarier and worse than climate change. Sure, in the short term, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it, wouldn't it make more sense for us to have this massive, uh, you, you know, they're talking about having the Manhattan Project for climate change. Why don't we do that for poverty or, you know, ob health in general? <laughs> well, I can, well, for two reasons, right? Because health and poverty are mostly about individual activities, uh, you know, that are personal. Um, and climate change is a lot more about uh, industrial level activities that are more easily accessed and regulated by the government. So they tend to be more receptive to state action than those other activities. I mean, we've tried to eradicate poverty in America. We've had what the war on poverty since the 1950s. So we have er we've eradicated abject poverty in the West. Well, yeah, okay, that's true. We we have we have eliminated. Yeah, abject poverty or sort of, ab you know, the part, the kind of poverty where you actually starve to death. That doesn't happen in America, right? You just have the kind of poverty where there's your life is kind of, kind of sucks. And we're facing our all obesity, obesity related problems, as bizarre as that sounds. I mean, they're well, they have too much. I mean, I've been poor before in America, and there's actually, I think there are real problems in the US when it comes to poverty because, um, because we live in a rich society and if you're poor you don't fit in very well so there's a lot of laws designed to protect rich people's property and they end up destroying poor people's civil liberty in the process i'd say climate um, change is one of them for sure i'm sorry i'm getting a phone call now so there's things binging in my ears <laughs> <sighs> insurance people again so um uh it's so hard to concentrate <laughs> i'm sorry why don't you say something while i'm listening oh, yeah, to this? I'm sorry well uh, again, I don't see sea level rise does not seem to be as big of an issue as it's portrayed to be. I mean, people living in 2100 seem like they're going to have a hell of a lot more science and technology and money than us. I mean, think about how much the I, I've seen a lot of projections about how much climate change is going to cost based on 2012 inputs. I mean, ignoring the, the hilarious way in which these models cannot be accurate, period. I mean, no economic model that's going out to 100 years is going to be accurate. To begin with, sure. but you know, aside from that, it, think about how much the economy is going to grow in a hundred years. Think about how much it's grown since nineteen seventeen. That's a long fucking time. Yeah. I mean, it seems like they're all going to be billionaires by then. Who who's going to be billionaires? The poor people, people living then. I mean, they. I mean, money might not even so. the same thing to them. Sure, yeah, no, it's 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 there a might not even be scarcity. Like we don't know. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. Um, you know, like I said, again, I, I think climate change is kind of a big deal in the sense that the climate matters a whole, like I said, I get my argument, the climate matters a whole lot to human civilization, uh, determines the food we grow, it determines the environment we live in. Um, there's huge economic impacts with tourism and whether or not the weather is sunny in sunny California or in Florida or whatever, right? So it behooves us to understand the environment and manipulate it in ways that we think is useful. So I tend to be in favor of research. I tend to be in favor of, I don't know, what I would call just generally wise practices. So, you know, a lot of the time the, the conflict comes down to does uh, X coal company want to pay the money in order to put a big filter on their plant so that it puts out less CO2 or not? Right. And if I'm weighing uh, the potential impacts of global warming versus making the giant coal company put a filter on their stack, I tend to be kind of like, well, let's let's work towards putting the filter on the stack, because the, the less we muck around with the environment we live in until we understand it, the better, generally speaking. Now, should we just shut down all the coal plants? No, like you, you, you take some kind of compromise position in the middle. Uh, you make reasonable steps. Uh, I replaced most of my light bulbs with LED light bulbs over time because they last a lot longer um, and I don't have to throw them out. So even though I suppose there's no real harm to throwing stuff into landfills all the time, uh, you know, to a degree, I would rather not do it as much as possible. I try to be conservative let's say with our environment in that sense like not waste stuff that doesn't need to be wasted yeah so but to me, that's just the smart. argument for like co2 scrubbers and reducing emissions should be more related to human health and the impacts that it has on our lugs like i lived in saigon for a year and i i feel like i've done like permanent damage to you know me and my family's lungs just by living there because it's oh, so yeah, yeah dirty and uh, polluted and shit and you know even shanghai is, would be worse than that but uh to me that's the argument for reducing co2 emissions not 
you know, this bogus, you know, maybe in a hundred years we might get a, a meter of sea level rise. Like, holy but shit. I don't Humans living in 2100 will will laugh at the the idea that we thought this was such a great danger to them. I mean, think about the kind of science and technology they're going to have compared to what we have right now. It's oh, yeah. joke. It's not even common. Well, I think the problems will get solved. And like I said, here's here's my thing. You know, I've I've been in debates with people and they're like, we're just wasting money. This is just a liberal political trick. And uh, we don't want to give those scientists any more money. I mean, these are the same kind of people that are like anti-vaxxers and, you know, they, they hate science. They don't trust anybody who's smarter than they are. And um, so they're like, no, we need to cut off all this funding. We need to stop talking about global warming. We need to crank out as much coal and drill baby drill and just get as much cheap money as we can, as fast as we can. And I, I'm just not part of that crowd, right? I'm like, no, you know, I mean, all the oil and all the coal are going to come out. Why? Because it's cheap energy that's available there for us. And we're going to do it one way or another. But I just think we should well, we, do it responsibly. We really just invented uh, an impossible drive. That's supposedly impossible, according to the laws of physics. I know what you're talking about, yeah. The fucking thing works somehow. And we're talking about, like, RCP 8.5, where we're lit we burn up all the oil that exists, and coal is the main <laughs> source of energy going Yeah, no, I mean, that's not going to happen, right? But... Fucking bizarre crock of shit. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Look, I'm, I'm not a doomsday guy. You know, I was in a debate where oh, we were talking about Trump, and it was Trump's worst president, right? And I'm like, well, that's ridiculous because he's he's been in office eight months. You can't judge him from a historical standpoint, right? My opponent was just like, well, Trump is going to engage global warming and destroy the planet. And I'm like... I saw that one. I was laughing. The, the worst that happens is I suppose we could kill ourselves. It doesn't seem terribly likely, but the planet's going to be fine. Um, and, well, and yeah, we'll survive, and we'll build dikes. We'll do whatever we have to do to survive. The human beings... Like I said, we survived with no technology when there was a mile of ice on New York City, right? Well, yeah, well, we're going to manage okay. no matter what happens. 120 meters in the in the last 18,000 years. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a young Earth creationist. I believe humans were here 18,000 years ago. Yep. I, I mean, some people might dispute that, but I think humans were here yeah, uh, so 18,000 years ago. And we've had 10,000% sea level rise yeah. compared to what's expected to occur between now and 2100. Yeah. Um, I don't, I've not seen any evidence that, uh, you know, humans were on the brink of extinction no. during any period. <laughs> like, so I, I guess we, we agree in the sense that there's a lot of hyperbole out there. There's a lot of like exaggerated, uh, ideas of what, what could happen, especially just in the general public imagination. Right. I think policymakers, you know, they, they do, some of them, let's say the good ones, are doing some bottom line comparisons. They're like, how much does it cost to deal with these problems versus how much does it cost to try and reduce emissions, right? And, well, the problem with these models know. is that they don't, their inputs based on 2012 can't possibly be accurate. It would be like if we had a model based on our consumption of whale oil in 1890 or, or whenever the fuck, you know, based, yeah. on, based on our projections, uh, you know, whale oil consumption is going to rise to this. It's like, no, we fucking invented gasoline and kerosene and shit like that. So whatever your projections were, they're wrong. And that I believe that's, of course, going to be the case with, uh, you know, the economic models of climate change there. How do you account for technologies that don't exist, but probably will, you know, have like a guess? Yeah. I mean, I, in software development, uh, you know, I used to practice what's called risk management, which is a process where you, you write down all the risks of the things that could happen. Then you come up with um, ways to either reduce the risk or ways to deal with the risk if it, if it gets realized in one way, shape, or form, right? So mitigation versus, I'm going to forget my terminology. Anyway, so you, you do this process, right? So you identify the risks. Some of them are like the burning bill, the the building burns down and you know, the impact is we're screwed. Right. And so what are we going to do if, uh, well, if we have offsite backups, then we'll have our data at least. Right. And we can, so you go, okay, well, we need a plan to put some data on the back offsite backup. Then you're like, is the cost of, you know, it's, it's an insurance question. Is the cost of storing data offsite worth the risk that the building will burn down? And, you know, you just try to figure that stuff out. I've, I see it the same way as this. I mean, yeah, so if the models are maybe not entirely accurate, which we know they're not 100% accurate, right? Um, we, you know, may have some variance between zero and 100 on how confident we are on them. At what point do we take some kind of an action to mitigate the risks, right, to try and reduce the impact or to try and uh, prepare for the eventual outcome. 
me watching politics, my view is that we're going to have to prepare for the outcome because I don't think there's quite enough political will to really control CO2 at the levels that people think we need to. So I'm pretty sure we're going to have to deal with whatever it is that is going to happen. Um, so we just got to be somewhat prepared for that and have the contingencies. I, I think in the meantime, if we can reduce CO2 emissions, that's probably a good idea. Not Absolutely not to zero because there's a lot of things we need to do with their energy. But, you know, we should work in that direction at least, uh, I think. Cause but are feel-good policies actually better for society, like the Paris Accords, for example? This the entire purpose is a feel-good policy. Like, if you were to actually examine, is this going to change the outcome of climate change at all? Based on the, you know, based on your own projections, you're saying if we reduce CO two by this amount, what would be the outcome of that? Nothing, of course. It's just a feel-good policy, so that people can feel better about doing something when they're really not doing jack shit. All they're doing is making themselves feel better. Yeah. I don't know enough about the specifics of the thing to, to, to judge what CO2 I think. To, to reduce CO2 emissions to a level, which according to their own projections yeah. would actually do something to mitigate and, you know, not maybe even possibly reverse, but that seems out of the question at this point, yeah, but at least so. stop climate change. Yeah. Th those would take drastic reductions of CO2, not kind of, not a little right. bit. We're talking drastic reductions in CO2, which for sure is going to have an effect on the economy. You know, regardless yeah. of what people think, that is going to affect the economy, especially in developing nations. Yeah, and I think in the short term, it's probably just not realistic, right? It, we're probably going to have to deal with it. I, I, like I said, I'm, I'm kind of okay. You know, it's just because we can't do everything doesn't mean we shouldn't do something. So I tend to be kind of for a, a moderate approach of making efforts to reduce CO2 emissions uh, at, as much as of a level as we can get people to accept. Right. And, then, and that's just, it's kind of a marketplace of marketplace of worry or concern. <laughs> right? I mean, obviously there's kind of a cultural battle going on where people are trying to, half people are trying to scare other people and the other half are trying to say, no, there's nothing to worry about. I think the middle, you know, the middle is where, where the truth is at in this case, right? There's, it's only logical that it's gonna have some kind of impact when we crank out all the CO2. Um, it's also logical to me that we'll figure out a way to deal with it one way or another, right? Um, but, you know, uh, I'm, I'm happy to start here by, taking some kind of measures in order to reduce emissions by having more fuel efficient vehicles, uh, limiting the, you know, making sure that plants are as clean as the technology reasonably allows and that, that kind of process. Um, and there's some, I'm willing to pay some economic costs for that, but not, you know, not just shut down the coal industry or something like that. I don't think that that's, I, I'd, I'd say that's an example of Western privilege. I mean, you're already rich. Sure. You're a Westerner. Yeah, so totally. Yeah. For you, it's like, Hey, yeah, let's, uh, let's reduce, emissions because yeah. uh, you know i've got my fit so fuck everyone else yeah. but if you're like in a, a developing country that's the difference between living in abject poverty and not living in abject poverty and I, i'm not gonna go i'm not gonna go down to an african tribe and tell them to stop burning their wood to to heat their home or something right i, I think that's absurd you know we, you have to be realistic. If you want them to do that, you're going to need to go provide them with a nuclear generator or something so they can do it another way, right? Um, or even just China or India or even Russia. I mean, yeah. uh, China's kind of been pretty aggressive about pollution. They're going through kind of what we did in the 70s, where they really got the kind of pollution that chokes people, right? And covers yeah, them that's, with that's what I'm saying. Yeah. To me, that is the threat of CO2, like actual health effects that can be measured, not like I don't some law term scenario that may or may not happen except i don't and think co2 is responsible for that that's like heavy metals in the air and 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 at, you know um that's what i mean like actual health effects though yeah well i mean that's life. not from co2 though you know that's like i said you know america when i was a kid we had acid rain it would really like burn the leaves off of trees not instantly but you know over the course of the season and uh you know the river the chihuahua river caught on fire like 12 times and uh, it was nasty i mean uh, the Cuyahoga, yeah, it was just kind of gross, uh, and you know the streets were dirty and stuff. And my my mom actually worked in um, uh, emissions inspections in Alaska, and she got all kinds of flack, and there were all kinds of people saying, "No, this is a huge waste of time. We shouldn't do this. It's not going to do any good, et cetera, et cetera." But actually, it worked really well, um, and we got rid of most of those problems in the U.S. by being responsible, um, not by going crazy, but you know, 
taking yeah but the reason for that was actual pollution i mean the fucking rumor yeah. caught on That's I, know, I, I know but there were people at the time who were like oh you know we, we're gonna lose jobs it's gonna be terrible it's gonna be an economic disaster if we do these things right well imagine they were if wrong it, too right you know that was the that river catching on fire they're like well you know in 100 years <laughs> uh you know these people might have it might possibly get you know a foot or two of sea level rise i mean I, you I, think that would have to any kind of substantial change like yeah uh, yeah no i agree with you that it's not as impactful because it's not immediate people are really generally pretty short-term focus right so that's and, and i don't have a lot of illusions that you can make politicians be long-term focused um every once in a while you get some visionaries who kind of think that way but most of the time people are only interested in what's up for the next election cycle or you know what well the problem wouldn't right warrant now. a long-term solution to begin with i mean we're talking about People living a long time from now. That's a long time. I yeah. mean, you'll probably not be alive then. Probably not. Likely. <laughs> <laughs> nor, nor will I. Uh, you know, maybe our kids will, for sure. But we don't have a fucking clue what that world will even look like. I agree. Because if you went to somebody in 1917 and said, you know, and you brought them here to 2017, would you, do you and you asked them, you know, what's changed the most in your view? Would you think they would talk about this fucking sea level? No. No, I mean, you can see, you can see, poverty from space now you can see which areas are lit up and which ones have zero co2 emissions i mean look at north yep. and south korea that's that's the difference between poverty and producing a lot of greenhouse greenhouse gases yeah, right totally. there yeah you're right i agree with that yeah so i mean climate change is a totally exaggerated threat it's pure hyperbole the truth is we don't have a clue how the people living in 2100 will be living and wh whether or not they'll be laughing at this as a problem. I mean, for all we know, they'll just engineer some fucking, some bacteria that eats plastic and shits oxygen. And then it'll <laughs> eat all the Maybe fucking seal. And then it'll eat us, you know. Now, <laughs> <laughs> now the thing, but but here's the thing. I mean, uh, I agree to it to a degree, right? But a lot of people are going to use that as kind of an excuse. They're going to go, oh, well, the future people are going to fix all these problems. So we don't have to really worry about it right now, you know. Let's just, um, you know, kick back and enjoy our vodkas and, and you know, piss down the river, right? And I, I just, I can't, I can't really abide that, right? I, I feel a responsibility if we see something that's a problem due to our own actions that we should take reasonable measures, um, as reasonable yes. as we can figure out to, Poverty, to deal with them. Healthcare. Sure. These are things that we can actually <clears throat> do in effect. And war. War, we can definitely affect since we're the ones that cause it. Uh, and it's usually caused at a macro level, right? And so that's something I definitely feel we need to do something about. Um, stop killing each other would be great. Um, poverty is hard because, you know, it's it's a confluence of conditions and people's individual choices. And some people want to be poor, and that's fine, right? If, if they don't want to have money, that's okay. There, you know, Unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of people in other parts of the world that, you know, certainly don't want to be poor and are and there's a lot of reasons for that that should try to address i hope um well but i don't know I, that you can I, ever totally I, eliminate like, poverty right they should at least have the option like we do here like yeah. people in america have the option not to be poor i mean you could just work your fucking ass off and not yeah. be poor anymore like it your, your base level here in america in the western world is the top 32 percent of the world yeah like, that's totally. the bottom that's the starting yeah. point for you. if yeah. you're in the bottom five percent you you start off in the top thirty two percent, and you're very statistically likely to get above the bottom five percent at some point in your life. Yeah, unless you're mentally disabled or you've got a serious problem of some kind, right? That's the, that's the. Now, one there's exception. outliers, of course. Yeah. I mean, there's always outliers, but yeah. you know, in general, general you know, <clears throat> people should be given the option to be not not poor. Yeah, you totally. Know? And I think that's a much more worthy uh, something that should deserve more attention and more time and more effort. And more resources than you know, one a possibly a meter of sea level rise. If the world completely loses its mind and we stay on coal for the next century and we burn up all the oil in the world, and Africa, you know, the world population goes to twelve billion, but Africa does not reduce its population even after its wealth goes up. You know, even if we do the the worst nightmare scenario, it still doesn't seem like that. But I mean, one meter in any case in a hundred years really isn't that big of a deal sure well i mean if i were doing the world's budget right somehow 
um, I would definitely devote more to uh, limiting war and uh, leaving poverty than I would devote to uh, green energy stuff. But I would still allocate money to green energy stuff, right? I, I wouldn't ignore it. Um, but it wouldn't be the top of my priority. It'd probably be, I don't know, number 10, something like that, right? I, energy is really important in general. So I'm all for energy technologies, whatever they happen to be. You know, there's a giant solar fusion furnace in the sky. Take advantage of it, right? Um, there's a lot of things that you can take advantage of, and I'm, I'm all for that. Um, but um, Apparently yeah, there's I, I would agree with your priority list, right? Yeah. Oh, let's go to the question real here. Uh, Joe Dodd, 35, is the reason we should deal with climate change now not because it will become more difficult to deal with at a later date? See, that's my that's my whole thing. That That is part of the narrative of why we have to ask, act now because in the future we're not going to be able to do nothing or, you know, something along those lines. But think about how crazy that is. That would be like someone in 1917 saying, you know, if we don't act now, people in 2017 – with our technology and our understanding of science, they're not going to be able to do anything about it then. Bullshit. People in 2100 are going to have a hell of a lot more options than we have here right now. Like what, what we might perceive as a big issue may not be an issue at all to people living at that time. I mean, it, it could be like a laughable thing. I'll say that, but you know, here's the other thing though, is, um, you know, tomorrow's technology starts today, right? So uh, like, you know, I was talking about that NASA satellite that they put up in orbit that can watch the CO2 on the planet. I think that's fantastic. I'm a hundred percent for that. Sure. It's, yeah. it, it not only helps us understand the climate better so that we can deal with climate change or understand what we can do, but I mean, it just, it broadens our knowledge so much of what's going on in the world. Um, the pictures from that thing are incredible. Just, you know, like I said, you're watching the planet breathe and you can see like North America exhale, right? And all this CO2 comes up into the air as all the plants decay. And then as spring comes and they, zoop, they get sucked back down. Uh, the year they launched it was a big El Nino year. So they got to watch really dramatic shifting around. So I think that stuff is fantastic. And that's the kind of technology that will give us information that will lead to better technology in the future, right? So I think well, we need I, to keep yeah. thinking steps like that. I think we both, we align clearly on our, you know, advocacy of science and things like that. Yeah. What I'm saying is I'm trying to draw a distinction between climate science and climate policy, because these are actually two completely separate things. True. And I would also take it a step further and say that a climate scientist is absolutely not qualified in any way more than the average person to weigh in on climate science. I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, policy. Uh, policy obviously right I agree. I mean, yeah, I mean, economist, the, and an, an economist is infinitely more qualified to weigh in on climate policy than a climate scientist uh there's a climate I, scientist i think, is not I think they should both have input and then a politician really is the one who is supposed to weigh the different information right i mean a good politician that's what they're supposed to do they're supposed to get all the expert opinions and then try to make a wise judgment uh understanding the needs of the people that are going to take those expert opinions into account Right, but I just don't I don't think it's a good idea to be merging science and politics in the way that, you know, that it has been with global warming and a lot of other issues. I don't I don't think that's good for science at all, because you, you should have a sharp distinction between what the science actually says and, you know, what people say that we ought to do about it. You know, it's kind of similar to the is ought problem. But uh, more yeah. more generally, I'm saying that science answers certain questions. But, you know, economics makes more normative claims like, oh, is that good or bad? It makes value judgments. What should we do about it? Uh, which option should we choose? You know, if you want to talk about shaky models, though, those <laughs> economics models are, are uh, as shaky as they come a lot of the time. But, uh, yeah, and well, I have no, a degree in economics. Well, so that's law, kind of my... law is just as uh, infinitely more accurate than any climate model I've ever seen. Uh, sure, for technology, yeah, I would agree. More consistent. Uh, but it's a lot, in a way, less complicated, but yeah. Okay, well, I think I've said my piece. Uh, I, I think climate is important. It's not the most important thing facing mankind. Don't think it'll destroy us all, but uh, it may cost us a lot of money. And for some individuals, it's going to be very important because their beachfront properties might go away uh, or get blasted down by a hurricane or something like that. So I, I believe in taking some measured steps to move forward, always moving forward on the topic, but not panicking and waving our hands around like we're all going to die. Um, that's about how I see it. Okay. I want to I appreciate, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to debate me. I want to say that um, I'm not too concerned with millionaires and their beachfront homes. I think, you know, within a hundred years, you, you probably should be, 
you're taking your home down and building a new one. Anyways, I don't know that many people who live in homes that are over 100 years old, and I don't really think it's going to be that big of an issue by 2100. So thanks, man. Cool, man. Later.